If you expose yourself, maybe you go to art galleries sometimes, or maybe you just enjoy art, as you see more paintings or illustrations or uh, works of art, you find that as you look at it, there's usually something that will resonate with you. And sometimes it's a very universal effect that it'll have on you. One of the amazing things about art, too, is that it can be so well recognized. There are certain paintings or sculptures that if you were to see it, you could probably say, that's what that is. Like the one that's going to be on the screen right now. Chances are, if you've seen this work of art that's coming on the screen right now, <laughs> slowly coming on the screen, it's so good you have to wait for it. You've got to wait even longer now. There are certain pieces of art, like as soon as this one comes on the screen, <laughs> it's not on the screen. All right. Well, anyway, there's this, hey, there it is. Sorry, sometimes things don't go as planned. Uh, it seems like it's that kind of morning. This piece of art, does anyone know what this is? Starry Night, yeah, who's it by? Van Gogh, right? There's, maybe we're not familiar completely, but maybe we didn't know the title of this work, or maybe we didn't know the artist, but there's a chance that you've seen something like this before, and it kind of resonates with you. This is a beautiful piece of work. Now, what I love about this painting, personally, is all the movement that's found in it. And sometimes I can find when I look at this painting, I can get lost in the movement of it all, that there, there's a swirl going on, and it kind of draws me in. And what happens is when I get focused on something, I can miss out on what else might be there, and I could just overlook it. The thing about this painting that I find even more interesting than actually what I'm attracted to in it is what is missing in it. Some of us who know who Van Gogh is, maybe we don't know too much about him. One of the things we might know about him is at some point in his life, he had a breakdown and he mutilated his ear. Whether he fully cut it off, we don't really know. And because of that, he ended up in an asylum for a year. It was while he was in that asylum that he made this painting. He was looking out his window at a landscape, and this was the landscape through the day that he saw, yet he painted it at night. And as he painted it, this is how he interpreted what he saw. What's missing in this painting that could easily be overlooked is that most of the buildings have lights on, but the church doesn't. Most of the windows have some kind of light coming out of it, which would be understandable, but the church is completely dark. And it would be easy to go, well, it's nighttime, so maybe nobody's at church. That could make complete sense. But in Van Gogh's time, there was a good chance there'd still be candles burning or something radiating light. His story is that he's actually the son of a Dutch Reformed minister. And at one point in his own story, he was very zealous for the church. He wanted to be a pastor as well. And he went on this evangelistic event moment that he had, and he found he was really unsuccessful at it. And it started to begin part of his struggle. He seemed to lose meaning in church. And over time, he grew to resent church and his father, and part of it might have been his mental health struggle. So how does someone like Van Gogh, who at one point was incredibly zealous, wanted to be a pastor, felt it was like the right thing to do, go from that to going, the church isn't very valuable at all, which is part of what's represented in that painting. There's no light coming from it. How does that movement happen? Is it just a series of instances, or is this a major event that occurs? And maybe let's move away from Van Gogh and think about ourselves. Some of us, maybe we're watching online, maybe we're even here at this moment, whether we've gone to church for a long time or not for so long, may have had times, or maybe in that time right now, where you go, what the heck is the point of all this? Why are we even doing this? Is there any value in church, in God, in any of it? Was it something that caused this? Was this a scandal that you heard of? Or was there something else that might have occurred? Usually, from the people I talk to, people I know who have been part of church and moved on, 
or never were part of church but have a perception on things, it's not usually one big event. It's a gradual movement. But should the church have no light coming out of it, like Van Gogh sees, like some of us see? Or is there more to it? I think there's more, and I believe that Jesus gives us a picture of what we should or could do so that we don't fall away or move away from that light that is present. As we continue on in this series called I Am, which we're looking at the statements Jesus makes about himself, he makes one particular statement, which is actually the last of the I Am statements, though you get one next week. It's the last one, and it kind of ties it all together in some ways. And it's found in John 15. But before we get to that, please allow me to pray. Father, I thank you that we get to be here this morning uh, in person, online, or maybe later on than this morning, maybe throughout the week, and explore, Jesus, who you say you are. And I pray that as we talk about this statement that you make about yourself, that our hearts and our minds are open to what you have for us, that maybe if we are someone who has wondered what is the point of Christianity, of church, of following Jesus, that this statement can resonate with us and remind us or challenge us to be part of something much better and bigger than we can imagine on our own. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in John 15, uh, which seems to happen, if if you know how numbers work, after chapter 14, if you were here with us last week or if you were online, we were exploring a statement Jesus makes in chapter 14, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And it was being said in a moment where he was having a meal, a final meal, what we call the Last Supper with his closest followers, and it's still in that setting that we come to his next I am statement. It's still in that setting where he knows he's about to be betrayed, be betrayed, where he knows he is going to go die. It is in that setting where he's sharing this meal that he makes this statement again. Last time it was to comfort and remind of the hope to come. This time it's to decide how to live daily, even when things are not easy. John 15, 1 says this, is I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Now this is a very horticultural kind of image that we're exposed to. And for some of us, it would be very familiar. Maybe we've gone to church for a while. Maybe we would just remember the song that Michael just led us in, where it's speaking of this very topic. And we can imagine and think of what a vine is, what what a vine does, and we're familiar with that. And we go, okay, that's, that's a plant. We got that. For some of us, we're not so good with plants. And if you had a vine, you probably don't anymore because it's dead. For some of us, we love our plants and they're growing and thriving and wonderful. And what we know is that a plant needs to be in the right environment. It needs the right watering and sunlight and all those things to thrive. And if you take those things away, it doesn't do so well. And so we can get that image going. We can be thinking about that when we have this picture. But there's another picture that Jesus is drawing on, and it's one from the Old Testament. In particular is that Jesus, multiple times, is referring to something about the Old Testament, when he makes these I am statements. Over and over again, showing that he is everything they've hoped for. And when he makes the statement that he is the true vine, he's doing that again. You see, in the Old Testament, one of the ways that Israel was talked about was that it was a vine. It was God's vine. It comes up multiple times. In uh, the Psalms, the psalmist writes in Psalm 80 that it was the vine that was transplanted out of Egypt to be God's people. But it also comes up in a very negative way. The prophet Isaiah, speaking for God in Isaiah 5, talks about how the people of God, Israel and Judah, is the vine, but it's a bad vine. It's producing bad fruit. And he says in particular that he's been looking for justice, and all he sees is bloodshed. He was looking for righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. The picture that comes up in the Old Testament and what Jesus is alluding to is that the people of God were always called the vine, 
but they weren't always doing what they were supposed to be doing. So this religious system of Israel is the vine, but it's not producing the fruit it's been meant to. It's not doing what it should have been doing long, long ago. And so as Jesus is speaking with his closest friends, his followers, people he loves, he says, you know that way that you were going before, following Judaism, following the law? That's not the real vine. I am. He's saying a lot in this very agricultural picture that we could easily overlook and still get much out of. But he's saying that his way is God's true way. But let's continue in the text. Speaking of the father, the gardener, he says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. His statement is this. He is the real way, the proper way. And if you stay in him, you will be fruitful. You will experience the fullness of life that he promises in John 10. But if you drift, you go away, you miss out. He says that you'll be pruned out uh, or cleaned and prepared for this, meaning that it's not always easy, but some of you who know, who maybe are thinking of planting your gardens right now or have plants inside, sometimes you have to remove parts of the plant to keep it thriving, to keep it well. In the same way, I think we go through moments of suffering and struggle, not because it's a good thing, but ultimately because it is, in the end, a good thing. That it's something that we work through that God allows us to work through so that we become more and more who we've always been meant to be. That's not always easy to process, understand, or even accept. But it's part of our journey sometimes. And sometimes we can see that after the fact. We can see good that comes out of the difficulties. And that's a bit of what he's saying right here. And as he continues on, he's actually going to repeat the same statement three different ways in the rest of this section that we're going to read. Over and over again, he's going to reiterate the same concept so that his closest friends know and we know what he's talking about. He continues in verse 5, says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, and that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So there's, again, saying the same thing, that if you remain in him, you will thrive. There's two statements that come up in this section that are a little bit unique. And one is a statement that some of us can take, and sometimes we take a little bit out of context, that if, you know, you ask, God will give it to you. I think any of us knows that sometimes we ask for things from God and we don't get it. I think any of us knows sometimes we ask for things from God and actually they're not very good things to be asking for. And many of us know sometimes we've asked for things from God, and that's a little bit why we feel like the lights are out on the church, and we feel distant from God. The statement isn't like a, a, a blanket statement to say whatever you ask, God gives you. It's actually rooted back into the point that if you remain in the branch, if you remain connected to Jesus, what you ask should be coming out of that relationship. So what you ask won't be for yourself, but for what God is up to. As we think about Holy Week, for those of us who are familiar with church experience, as we think about Easter, many of us can recall the story of Good Friday, and part of it is that Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours, when it came to his death. Sometimes what we ask for needs to be not my will, but God's. 
And so if God is going to answer us with whatever we ask, we need to be reflecting on whose will are we trying to achieve in this ask. And so as Jesus is making the statement of remaining in him, abiding as we sang in the song or other translations would use, he's talking about part of what you ask should come out of that relationship. So let's continue reading. In verse 9, he says, As a father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, then you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know the master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So Jesus, in his last meal with his closest followers, has been expressing who he is more and more. And he culminates it with this statement that he is the vine. And as the vine, he is the proper and true belief system compared to what they knew before. And what we are invited to do is to remain in him and when we remain in him, we produce good fruit. What is fruit? Well, we think about a vine. Well, okay, there's you know, grapes or whatever that's coming off. And you know you've had an experience where you buy grapes and maybe they're not so good. That's why we all taste them beforehand, even though we shouldn't. You know sometimes the fruit isn't good that's produced. But when the, what Jesus is saying is in the moment, if you are doing what you're meant to be doing, which is remaining being nourished, being sustained through the vine, you produce good fruit. The Apostle Paul later on will express that what we call the fruit of the spirits, and those are very much character traits that come out of us, not something that we go and try to do, but something that grows out of us, like kindness, because of who we are close to, Jesus. It's God's work in us that comes out. That's the fruit. Not something that we strive to do to make happen, but that we are remaining in him and allow that relationship to cause growth and life and fuel. I mean, think about the plants that you have, if you do have plants. If they are meant to produce fruit, fruit you might try to water it more or give it more sunlight to try and make it do that, but the fact is if you do more and more and more, you kill your plant. There's a balance. There's an amount that it needs. And if you try to do more to an actual plant, it dies. In the same way, what we are meant to do is to remain in Christ. Yes, we are to do things, but when we try to overdo it so that we achieve what we think is right, we burn out, we get frustrated, we see that the church has no lights on and give up, walk away. For most of us, when we walk away from God, when we walk away from church, it's not that big thing that happened. Maybe that big thing is a part of it. But usually it's a gradual exposure or gradual moving away from the vine, moving away from Jesus. And as we gradually move away from Jesus, we don't even realize it's happening. But Jesus says that if we remain in him, we will produce much fruit. That's what we're meant for. It's what we're supposed to do. It's what you're made for. So the question should be, how do we remain in Jesus? If remaining in Jesus is what gives us life, is what sustains us, and when we don't remain in Jesus, we burn out, we get exhausted, we give up, how do we remain in Jesus? In this passage, he lays out a few things. If you obey my commands, you do it. 
And for some of us, we might go, okay, well, which commands? And we can go through our New Testament. We can study what Jesus says about loving God and loving our neighbor as a priority. And yes, that's it. But if you try and try and try, you still might be overwatering or over sunlighting the you as the plant. If it's all about your own effort, you're not actually remaining in Jesus. There needs to be some kind of balance. That's not to say we're not meant to do anything. We are. We're meant to produce fruit. And in producing fruit, it starts with remaining in Jesus. This is one of the questions that the early church really wrestled with, is how do we remain in Jesus? See, for those of us who know a little bit of the story of the church, is that there was a period of time after Jesus' death and resurrection that the church has started, and the church for a few hundred years was what we'd call persecuted. They weren't a legal religion. So sometimes that persecution was from the, the Jewish culture, saying that, you know, these Christians, they're bad. We see this sometimes in the book of Acts. Sometimes it was from the Roman emperor saying this is not a legal religion. And so what would happen is these people who follow Jesus were worried about their life. And so it made them or got them to remain in Jesus. There was a threat to existence, and it helped them to thrive because they knew all they had was Jesus. But there comes a point in the story of Christianity where Christianity is no longer persecuted, where it becomes a legal religion in the third century. And as it becomes a legal religion, people started to wonder, well, life is easy now. I'm not worried about not having a job because I'm a Christian. I'm not worried about people throwing rocks at me because I'm a Christian. I'm not worried about my kids being ostracized in the community because I'm a Christian. They had it easier. So they wondered, how do we remain in Jesus when things are easy? And what ended up starting was what we call the monastic movement. People left cities, they went out into the wilderness, and they started communities and cultures that were revolving around something called a rule of life. And that's how they remained in Jesus. That word rule might sound a little intimidating for some of us. We don't like rules. You know, rules are, are a little bit restrictive, we think, sometimes. But the word for rule is re religio, which actually means like a trellis. It's what you put a vine on so your vine can grow. When you have a plant, when you have a vine, if you leave it on the ground, it will not produce fruit to its maximum potential. But when you put it on a trellis, it grows, it thrives. And so these early, we call them church fathers and mothers, created a rule of life, meaning what we do as people to stay with Jesus, to remain with Jesus, so they could be with Jesus and become more like him. And these would involve uh, daily practices that they would bring into their life. So it might be, and some of you actually do this and you don't realize, it might be that they read scripture every day. It usually was. It might be that they pray every day. Maybe they have set times they pray. Those of us who might come from other traditions, maybe uh, Catholic or Anglican or more liturgical traditions, we're familiar with what we call the, uh, the hours or the office, where you have certain times a day you were to pray. These would be a daily rhythm that would be part of the rule of life to be closer and be with Jesus. But it would also involve weekly rhythms. It's what you're doing right now. You're showing up to church. But more than showing up to church, it's participating in the life of a community, serving in some capacity, being with each other. It would also involve some form of hospitality, usually in a rule of life, where you would eat together and be with others. And most importantly, sometimes, is the observance of a Sabbath, of real rest in a week. And on top of that, there would also be monthly practices that they would insert into their lives of a rule of life. For myself, when I was doing better at this sort of thing, it would involve taking a half day away once a month where I would be in silence and prayer by myself. For others, it might be something dif uh, different that they incorporate in their life, that on a, some kind of routine rhythm they create. And then also it includes some yearly thoughts, maybe as a retreat or a, a mission trip or something like that. There'd be daily, monthly, sorry, daily, weekly, and monthly rhythms that incorporate into the yearly rhythm 
that guide what you do. This in the early monastic community would be what they would do to stay with Jesus. When they didn't have to worry about someone threatening their life, when they didn't have to worry about someone uh, taking uh, from them their possessions because of what they believed, they had to intentionally choose to rhythm their life centered around Jesus and what they did. That's how they remained in Jesus. And it's what we could do to remain in Jesus as well. A rule of life doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be a set of rules. It's just rhythms that we incorporate in our life that we say, how do I make being with Jesus a priority? And we do them. We keep in mind that what we want most is to be with Jesus and to be more like Jesus. So we sacrifice what we want now, which might be to watch all the Netflix shows we can or to not be with other people or to sleep in on a Sunday because we value what we want most even more and see why it's important. A rule of life is what intentionally draws us into abiding or remaining with Jesus. When we don't have a rhythm that revolves around Jesus in our lives, it's easy to ignore that relationship. It's easy to drift away from that relationship in such a way that we no longer see the lights on in a church, lose hope, don't see value in the God that says, when you remain in him, you'll be fruitful. Jesus' statement that he is the true vine is an invitation to us daily to remain with him, to be with him, so we can become more like him. But we have to choose moment by moment to make sure that's important to us. Because the easy thing is to ignore it. The hard thing is to be intentional and remain in Jesus. So ask yourself, what can you do to remain in Jesus today? Allow me to pray. Father, I thank you that you are the gar gardener that Jesus speaks of, that you are working in our lives to make us flourish. That even in the difficulties that we go through, the suffering and the struggles, you are working for our good because we love you. And that as you are working in our lives, you are inviting us to remain with you, Jesus. And that as we remain with you, you give this promise that we will be fruitful, that we will experience the fullness of life that you offer us. And that's not in a uh, way of consumerism to be fruitful or, or monetary gain, but in our character and who we are, you're making us more and more like we've always been meant to be when we are with you. I pray that, as Michael shared his prayer, that it is what we desire, that we desire to remain in you, Jesus, the vine, that your way is the right way, and that we remind ourselves in the little things we do to remain in you, to see the hope that you offer and embrace it in our daily lives. And I pray that today we make those choices, whatever they may be, to guide us, to direct us in being closer to you and becoming more like you. I just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.